Hey Juan, how's it going? Great to be here, great to be chatting with you. <laughs> yeah, well maybe let's get right into it. So we are now in, what's the year? I guess it's the fourth year of Filecoin's existence. Maybe take a moment, take a beat. Reflections, how do you feel things are going? Where are we today? What's bright and what's exciting you on the future? I mean, I think it's astounding to see the scale of the network. Uh, I think a lot of people, we, we, Filecoin grew so much so fast that people didn't quite process that in an, a very quick period of time, we assembled thousands to tens of thousands of people around the planet organizing a huge computational network that is a significant fraction of all of the storage on the planet and is in, in line of being able to compete with cloud companies. Uh, I think you know, when I first started talking to people about that in you know, 2014, at the beginning of the crypto landscape, and you know, even 2017, um, people thought it was completely crazy. Uh, people, I was laughed out of rooms when I was talking to people about how this was going to happen. And they're like, oh, you know, extremely intelligent people who had built you know, Web 1, and some people had built Web 2, uh, and knew the scalability of a lot of these systems, um, were like, well, maybe you'll get like 10 petabytes, maybe 100 if you're like really good. And uh, we blew through that in you know, weeks. And so I think like, the, um, the scale of success of the network in general in orienting a ton of people, and not just resources and, and hardware, but orienting a lot of people and a lot of developers and a lot of communities around the world uh, behind a vision, um, that's been incredibly successful uh, over this, this time period. And so that's been, been really, really great. Um, I think we've gone through a lot of ups and downs, especially because the, of the macro and crypto um, economic cycles, and those are quite difficult. And we are, you know, the, the entire Falcon network is an economy embedded on much larger economies, and so whatever happens to those, those other economies impact us. Um, but the kind of like internal integrity of the project and internal integrity of the network is amazingly strong, and, and it's been amazing to see the, that grow over time. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that I reflect on, so I had first heard about Protocol Labs in 2016, like read the white paper, I guess it was the second version of the Filecoin white paper, and I remember actually sharing it with a friend of mine who worked at Coinbase, and he was like, yeah, this stuff isn't going to scale. And honestly, one of the reasons why I think he was, I mean, clearly even now proven wrong is because he underweighted things like ZK as a technology and what that would mean. And I think one of the talks between even then and now that I remember you giving was around verifiability of the web and these, the need for these primitives that people don't really consider. And even now, I don't think people fully appreciate. And so you've been early on things like ZK Snarks. You've been early on Dpin. Filecoin is like one of the largest hardware aggregation things in existence. I guess, can you maybe articulate for folks who haven't thought about it at this level, why is Filecoin designed the way that it is? Why does it have the primitives that it does? How do you see that being important for all of these technical trends that we have, whether it's AI, whole brain emulation, I had a great conversation yesterday with someone on that, robotics. How do you see all these things fitting together? Yeah, it's a great question. So, and people in the crypto space think very uh, because it's a big part of the, of the blockchain substrate, so it's kind of given uh, by default, so a lot of people don't uh, really understand why it's so valuable. When you don't have verifiability, digital systems are very squishy. Uh, they can give you a commitment, and they can give you a description of what they're going to do, um, but you really have to trust people uh, on their word, or you have to trust brands on their word. And we've seen many examples where corporations have to change their business, and they're within market forces, and so they have to suddenly do something else. Um, or you know, you, lots of applications end up shutting down, and you know, lots of you know, thousands to hundreds of millions of angry uh, users lose their data or have to migrate it somewhere else or lose access to a software tool. Um, or you enter environments where corporations are pressured by uh, governments to do certain things, like spy on people, or like uh, what you think are your most private um, uh, personal notes and perspectives of you understanding the universe, or you talking to your friends or your family, suddenly start getting um, added to who knows what databases. Uh, we have a bunch of examples of social networks today running government-mandated code that gets to decide whether, like, you know, the thing that you're saying is approved or not. Um, and so that kind of uh, structure uh, where parties can change the underlying software on you, uh, I think is a very dangerous uh, foundation to build um, the, our digital existence on. Uh, I think it would be 
it's dramatically better to have hard verifiability where you have math enforcing the rules. Uh, you need math and game theory and economics to enforce the rules underneath the hood uh, for the verifiability of your infrastructure. I just think there's been many cases of censorship in the last um, few uh, decades. Um, we've seen it even with the internet where you know, overnight something happens and either a cable gets cut accidentally and some country loses access to the internet and everything grinds to a halt or um, there's some like government upheaval and suddenly somebody decides to like take down the internet um, and just imagine, like, think about how much of your life depends on the software that you use day to day, like your personal applications, like the connectivity that you have in terms of talking to people, this is how you work, how you communicate with your family. Um, just imagine any kind of natural disaster that suddenly you cannot reach people. Um, and like, that's the kind of um, possibility space when you don't have hard verifiability underneath. Um, and then kind of even in a more mundane sort of setting, um, organizations and companies that need to transact with each other uh, the moment that you have hard verifiability available to you, that primitive, you can transact with that primitive in a much uh, more secure way. You don't have to like have to guess and gamble on whether or not the other side is gonna uh, hold up their, their side of the deal. You have math helping you, right? So the amazing thing uh, uh, that blockchains have enabled is just um, you don't have to make deals with other people. You can make deals as specified by math. And so you make unilateral deals with the math, the math does deals with other parties, and that causes uh, the actions to happen. And it's, been, it's, it's just a tremendously better way of organizing people. It's a better way of organizing groups of people um, and, a, and a better way to build cloud infrastructure. Yeah, and I mean, I think a thing that people sometimes miss or at least missed before and maybe now feel more like is imminent, like the idea of programs being able to spend money for services sounded kind of silly or maybe theoretical even a few years ago. And now we're talking about AI agents and if you have an AI agent, how is that going to procure other services if it wants to be able to spin up a new AI agent that needs resources of its own? Um, so I think there is something that maybe the broader world hasn't fully understood about why verifiability and these hard primitives matter, especially for things that may exist as purely just programs and not just like trust-based systems. Yep. Um, I'm curious, and, and, and I would add there that just basic verifiability over pieces of information, like knowing that a specific document or a specific value in a database was X at a particular moment in time, and you have hard verifiability in that is integral to not just commerce and all commerce, but personal relationships and um, our civilization at large. Uh, just think of the ability for, um, you know, even today, like, you know, IPFS and Falcon have been used in critical cases, um, both in um, normal record keeping of you know, millions of uh, government documents by existing organizations and, and, and jurisdictions that are um, using you know, IPFS directly for doing this, um, or in some cases to gather a lot of critical um, information and evidence about conflicts happening around the world, uh, uh, critical um, uh, testimony in all kinds of uh, conflicts. And that becomes necessary information to keep and store and be able to refer back to um, as a society. Uh, and, and the thing that you're talking about AI agents, like in 2013, this was kind of clear to me and a few other people that we, we were headed in this direction. And then as soon as you had Bitcoin, you were gonna be able to use programs to do a lot of this stuff. Um, it ended up taking a lot longer. Um, I think smart contracts took a path of just being very simple things. Um, I had expected already to have much more sophisticated agents even before having AI. Uh, but now that we have LLMs as smart as they are today, um, absolutely, you, you can bet that today there are uh, many different LLMs out there with full access to wallets doing all kinds of things already. It's maybe not talked about as much, maybe you see Truth Terminal and a few other things out there, but there's, uh, I, I would bet that there's a lot of people playing around with this sort of stuff, and it's just gonna accelerate quite a bit. Um, I don't know whether or not the world's gonna do this, but at some point somebody may, some jurisdiction may choose to create an environment for AI agents to, to be kind of like, a, give, give AI agents of some sort personhood to some degree, meaning they're able to like transact, enter into contracts, hold property. And as soon as you do that, um, that, that opens up a, a huge set of potential um, you know, possibilities. Um, n never mind, that's even without thinking about these agents as conscious and, and people and so on, which is like a whole other layer that we're you know, uh, sailing fast into you know, five, 10, 15 years. I mean, I think like this is one of the areas that is going to be the most interesting maybe over the next five years where it's like, 
inside of the crypto world today, when we think about DeFi, we usually are just operating without the presumption of any sort of legal anchor. It's just like, this is why we need things to be over collateralized because it is all just happening in block space. But the moment you start having some legal anchor as well, you can start introducing trust primitives too. So if you want to resell the cash flows of a storage provider because that's settling on chain, like that gives you some sort of anchor that you can add on top. And so I'm actually curious, where do you see, like Filecoin as an ecosystem is different from a lot of others where we have sort of a real focus on this substantive like business value of we want to bring real business like cash flows into this economy. And so why that versus chasing meme coins or other things? How do you see that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, look, I personally got into, got ex really excited about this infrastructure um, because of its great potential for, for good in a ton of ways. Uh, it just can level up so, uh, our infrastructure and our society tremendously. And you know nothing against enter entertainment and and um, you know people uh, doing things for good entertainment value and so on. Um, I do think and and look ga um, uh, games of chance and gambling and so on as old as uh, uh, our civilization. So that that'll always happen and be a fraction of things and that's fine. Um, but I do think it's a problem when the fraction of the attention um, is given dramatically more to those those things. Um, most of what, what, a lot, what a lot of people came into this industry for was just a dramatically better way of doing things. Um, and that's where I'm personally super focused on getting to hard value, right? So all of the, all of the kind of entertainment, meme coin, casino culture of crypto is maybe big there because you can quickly grow, but it's just of a particular size and it's tiny compared to the large tech companies, right? So when, you, when you think about the cloud infrastructure or like the cloud companies or the now um, growing large scale AI labs, they're printing massive scales of money, right? Like we're talking about um, hundreds of billions in revenue per year. Um, and that scale of capital uh, is what it means to provide a massive scale service to the world that the world values and relies upon to conduct business and interact and, and survive and all, all that kind of stuff. So that's the real business. Like that's dramatically better and more exciting and more valuable than, than all of the meme coins. And so to me, um, having the ecosystem um, hyper-focused on getting strong product market fit to be able to deliver super high value uh, to end users and end customers that hire the, the storage in the network um, is kind of where the, where the real value is long term. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of these other kinds of things will come and go and it'll be fads and you know, the, 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 nature, the, the, the entertainment value in itself will linger, but which specific thing will capture attention at a given moment in time will change along the way. I mean, I guess maybe related to that, so Deepin in general, I think is like a larger movement outside of just the Filecoin ecosystem of people who I think share that sort of philosophy. As the founder of a movement that is now much larger than yourself, what advice would you give to other Deepin builders and folks who are thinking or interested in sort of creating that sort of like positive sort yeah, of- Yeah, like, totally. And let me talk a little bit about Deepin itself first and then I'll, I'll answer the advice question. So. Um, I think Deepin is incredibly exciting. So Filecoin is you know, one of the first Deepin networks before Deepin was a term. Um, and the core mechanic behind the whole thing is that you can take some service and you can use a blockchain to hire and organize that service. And the best mechanism for doing this is the block reward. Uh, from my perspective, the block reward is the most, one of the most valuable things that the entire crypto space has designed and built. Uh, it's an incredibly elegant and powerful mechanism. The, the big, you, you can see Bitcoin's hash rate rise as this amazingly perfect exponential that keeps growing and growing and growing. And it just shows you the degree of, of power behind that mechanism. Um, we, you know, initially I was, when I was first designing Falcon and talking about it, um, that was like the real promise, like being able to harness the power of that block reward to orient it to other services. And you can do this with storage, you can do this with bandwidth, you can do this with connectivity. You could launch a satellite internet network with this, this infrastructure. You can launch a real-time communications network with this infrastructure. You can do all kinds of things. And so I think that that's an extremely powerful primitive. And so from my perspective, like you can solve lots of problems this way and you organize um, millions of people and thousands to tens of thousands of organizations just with this simple mechanism. 
Um, uh, Nicola in, in the ecosystem, one of the uh, lead researchers and cryptographers, um, uh, talks about it as like, you know, how lazy cryptographers solve the world's problems. It's like you design a, this incentive structure, release it into the world, and like, you know, you have this amazing scale. And I'll highlight, you know, one of the, um, one of those that I'm super excited about is like the, the ability to build, I'll mention like two or three, like one is Glow, where you're, we're using the block reward to scale the solar output in the world by just enabling solar farms to be built against the block reward. Um, when you add solar and so on, you have like a bunch of volatility in the pricing and whatnot, and it'd be great to just be able to sell all your power to a network. And, and so Glow like does that and is now you know, putting into place the, the um, the block reward uh, exponential economics uh, to try and tile the planet with solar panels. And imagine if crypto suddenly becomes the way in which we got out of the global uh, climate change problem, right? Like there would be such an incredible mic drop of this industry uh, to itself in terms of, hey, we did something amazing, but also to the entire rest of the world. Like that would be, that would be incredible. Um, and, you know, even Huddle with a, uh, RTC network, being able to build a telephony network or an AV um, a pathway network where suddenly you have uh, nodes all around the network cutting down latency, only going to local participants, would be tremendously valuable. Like today, most of the, those networks run on a bunch of racks and servers owned by specific companies, and everybody has extremely powerful uh, devices, uh, both like your phones, your laptops, and also in your home. And so being able to use those devices to orient and organize all the communications in the, in the network is incredibly valuable and, and, and special. So I think like those kind of deep end networks are, are super, super valuable and a great way of solving large scale problems. Now, I think in terms of advice, what I would say is just don't forget that the how powerful the block reward is and just um, you know, really clean up the economic loops in the ecosystem. I think that's one of the things that we as a network and Falcon can do a lot better. We have a lot of like clunky economic loops that are too entangled and just simplifying those and making it very clear and obvious how to interact um, and, and orient. Um, David Warwick gave a great talk about this uh, later, earlier this year about, about doing that and I think that's a very good uh, way to think about it. I think another piece of advice there is uh, think long term. You can uh, just remember that a lot of these things have uh, take a while to kick in. Um, if you set up the right incentives, there's a lot of short-term problems you have to solve, but if you set up the right incentives and you, and you don't run out of money and you preserve you know, like your ability to continue on the thing, you can, solve, you can move mountains in, in a span of two, five, ten years. Uh, you can do tremendously large-scale things. And so I just see a lot of people in this industry be very short-term um, uh, oriented because they, they're pushed by all kinds of pressures in one direction or another. Um, and that, you know, you, you, to, to some degree, you have to respond quickly to things. Um, but you don't want to overfit that. You want to make sure that you are going to some true north for, for yourself or for your network and, and be, be willing to take these bold leaps in longer term um, uh, timescales. Uh, on this, I really th um, I think you know, a, a whole range of founders in, in, of, of great companies have demonstrating this kind of like long-term oriented back calculating from success. The major tech companies today were built that way, you, setting a, up a true north direction and then back calculating from that pathway. Uh, now it'd be great to be able to set um, uh, those directions and orient uh, thousands of people uh, towards those goals. I think here is where uh, I would invest early in public goods. Um, I think I wish I had known more about the, I, I wish I had understood the ability of crypto to use mechanisms to route capital much earlier. Um, because if so, I would have like built a lot more on-chain primitives in the design of Falcoin directly. Uh, but this is something that a lot of networks can can put in place after the fact. Um, I've I'm, today, I think I'm I'm orienting a lot of networks to or, to devote on the order of 10% or more of their total supply to br public goods broadly defined. And if you do that, then you create a cone of improvement where as your as your network is working, you scale you you scale and reinforce the network building itself. You, you initially orient that and aim it to the, the main priority things you need to build uh, to s help solve your immediate problems. But as you succeed, that amount of capital grows and you start funding all kinds of other downstream dependencies and then critical R&D and so on. So it's a, it's, a, it's a new form of capital organization with technology organisms. I wouldn't call them, it's not a technology company anymore, it's like a, a technology network uh, that is able to allocate a lot of capital, and if you, if you have this feedback loop going, um, I think this could be, I'm super excited about this sort of thing because I think it could be, it could replace the current dominant um, Silicon Valley style um, a single large company that goes into Wall Street and then you, know, you have stockholders and whatnot. You can totally replace that structure with these, these types of capital allocators, but it's gonna require that strong public goods feedback orientation uh, positive feedback loop.
For sure. Actually, I mean, this leads to something that I've been curious to pick your brain on. So we're at a moment in the ecosystem where we have a lot of L2s that are coming out, folks that are building symbiotically with the rest of the Filecoin ecosystem. And I'm curious if you had, now that we have a room full of folks who are in the network, what advice or what thoughts would you want to like inject in everyone's brains to think about how we can help support the next generation of builders that can help build the flywheel that symbiotically grows the Falcon ecosystem? Yeah, so um, Falcon is a large scale platform to organize a, a ton of different kinds of storage products. And so think of all of those individual you know, storage and computation and connectivity products as separate networks. And so each of those needs to be um, getting their own notion of product market fit with specific uh, things. But we can build a very strong suite of products, right? So think of like something like M uh, AWS S3. Like if S3 is competing with like um, CloudFront and not integra well integrated with CloudFront and it doesn't work with like the database product or whatever, and like you have like a very fragmented thing, then people wouldn't, won't use that suite as much as some other suite. And so if we can build like really good connectivity between all of these different products, and, it's, and there's very strong reciprocal economic flows that make it a, a great positive sum game for everybody involved, for all of these different networks to transact with each other, you get this open-ended growth that can, where you know, uh, each individual team can focus on a piece of the, of the puzzle, and you integrate a, a product suite that can deliver and compete with um, uh, l the large scale cloud companies, right? And so, like, that's kind of the 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 what's possible. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of things that the community can do to help each of the groups. So everything from um, just ask them what they need and help them, right? Like, actually, literally, just go and, and uh, connect with those groups. Ask what are the top priorities? What is a roadmap? What can you help with? Um, and then, so that's one piece. Second is we can build economic primitives into the network. There's probably ways of uh, constructing economic primitives directly into the network that support um, those, those uh, different L2s and applications. Um, a lot of stuff that, that I do tends to orient around just helping them um, uh, as organizations and as startups with capital and with um, uh, founder advice. And um, I spent a lot of time in the last two, three years building up infrastructure to support um, different founders and startups with all of the problems that they run into, uh, everything from you know, how to recruit people, how to, how to grow a team, how to operate a team, how to like, design products, how to get product market fit, all of those kind of like the, the, the bread and butter of building a high functioning operation. Um, I think there's you know, good ways of, of supporting. Uh, but there's probably a broader set of mimetic effects that I think could be really, really valuable. Um, think of Ethereum, I, th I personally think of Ethereum as the gold standard on this, um, where it's like the best community in orienting a large group uh, with values and a culture and an ethos um, and just this kind of like pay it forward mentality. And it's been uh, super good and super successful. Uh, and so I think we should create that very strong orientation in the Falcon community. And that itself will make a lot of people want to uh, be part of and develop and grow with the Falcon network. Um, I think in, in general, I tend to be um, very frustrated with uh, any parts where it just, the culture is causing people in, to be in too much tension. Um, because like any kind of conflict, well, sometimes through conflict, you can arrive at better decisions. Um, for the most part, I tend to take the view that conflict is, spends way too much time and it ends up wasting a lot of energy. And sure, you could have ar you argued a lot and you ended up a slightly better or maybe substantially better solution. But in that time, you could have already been off to the races and solving larger scale problems. And so, you know, I take, a, I take the Eric Drexler and um, Mark Miller view of Paradotopia, which is like, in general, for the most part, you just want to coordinate with everybody involved, even if you feel like you're in direct conflict. Uh, conflict tends to be destructive, and instead, just orient and growing the pie for everybody. Um, positive sum orientation is really, really good. Um, I think on this regard, I do think that we as a network need to do a better job at like um, defining r very clear roadmaps and pathways and like dependencies and uh, just orienting ourselves on like what everybody's doing to to help everybody um, move move faster. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think this leads into what might be my last question given the time we have left. So inside of crypto, maybe not so much like this week because I feel like everything is up and to the right. But if we were to go back a month ago, I feel like there was a lot of bearishness where people were just like soul searching and trying to figure out what are we here for? The crypto casino is doing its thing. And so I guess, how would you answer that question? Why are we here? And then maybe more specifically for Filecoin, yeah. how would you summarize its ethos? Like, what do you see as Filecoin's ethos? Yeah, so you know, I gave a talk earlier today at the um, Cypherpunk Congress uh, earlier about the, um, the 
how the internet today is in a precarious state where it's very exploitable and, and most of the infrastructure that we use is very ownable. Um, I don't mean own in terms of property, I mean own in, in the computer parlance, like you can break it. Um, and, it, it, and it can be censored and manipulated by all kinds of groups. And if we're not careful, we're setting up the infrastructure and systems to um, not just empower a few corporations to take control over all data and um, do um, you know, market-oriented things with it, which you know, aren't that bad in its own right, but certainly not as good as it could be. Um, but we're actually setting the infrastructure up to enable extremely bad totalitarian governments in the future. So if you think about 1984, uh, and you go read that book, like if you haven't read it in a while, I recommend you go back and read it. The technology described in 1984 is really tame. It's like you know a TV that can record you and broadcast what you're doing to some place. Guess what? Today, all of us walk around with three cameras in our pocket and a camera in our, in our laptop that's constantly looking at us, and there's tons of cameras in every building, and all of this is constantly recording everything you do, and it's integrating that information. Now, you can take that and then add facial recognition, which is now really good and really cheap, and modeling of behavior, and then you can start attaching social rewards to that, including you know, negative rewards. And so you can build the kind of like um, totalitarian control level um, system that you know, the worst dictators in history would have dreamed, only dreamed of having. And that entire infrastructure is possible to build today with the technology we have now. It's not technology of the future, it's like the stuff today. Um, and we're, we're very fortunate and lucky that the current governments are actually on the whole very good. Um, they tend to be very, uh, very well oriented. There's a lot of conf hard conflicts in the world and there's a lot of really bad things happening, but in the most part, the level of scale of problem is not like you know, the, the worst excesses of um, the 20th century level of problem. And so we have much better governments today. Um, but it's not a clear picture that we will preserve um, this current status, things could ter take turns for the worse. Uh, it's happened in every century. Every century has had falls. And, and it's really critical in my view that we build a dramatically better internet infrastructure quickly uh, to build the right safeguards for ourselves to create a, an internet infrastructure that respects human rights, a, an internet infrastructure that bakes in digital human rights directly in the internet layer uh, so that you can create a, a good and robust foundation for, for humanity in the long term. And that's only going to get more and more and more important as AI develops further, as robotics starts uh, 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 covering the world with like small little robots everywhere, or humanoid robots, um, or as soon as we start doing brain-computer interfaces and all of that, you know, opening up neurotechnology, all of that starts putting more and more and more power in the computational infrastructure. And we really need that to be aligned with humanity at large and with individual humans and with people and not aligned with specific corporate, not more aligned to specific corporate um, interests or specific government interests that today might be supportive but in the future might be, might be against you. And so I think it's really critical in the long term to have this like strong ethos of um, broadly improving the infrastructure that we use, like the digital infrastructure that runs the world, and aim for a, for a dramatically more human-oriented and, and digital human rights-oriented um, a platform. And, but look, the way to get there is by building high-quality products, getting product market fit, and being economically successful. So that's where our focus in the short term should be. But our long-term ethos should be to, do, to succeed in the market so that we can build this dramatically better infrastructure for everybody. Awesome. Thanks so much, Juan. Thank you. And, and thank you.